Hi everybody, welcome to part two of Transistors in a Nutshell. So in the first part we discussed how just the basic diode works. And I think that's important to understand the concept of that because just being a, you know, a two terminal uh, device, it's a lot easier to understand how it works. Now we're going to use what we learned in part one to kind of maybe try to get a better understanding of how a bipolar junction transistor works. Now, I know I'll always get a lot of questions of, you know, can you show us about a JFET or an IGBT or a TRIAC or an SCR, all these other semiconductor devices, but I want to try to keep it to the basics of this. And then those other things, even if you kind of do some online searches, they'll make a little more sense to you uh, when you learn about them. All right, let's get started. Now, a quick comment about the first video. Uh, one of you mentioned that why do I have the terminals marked backwards, cathode and anode? <laughs> Isn't the cathode supposed to be negative and the anode supposed to be positive? Well, that's one of the things is when we talk about polarity in an electric circuit, you have the polarity or the charge polarity of the device but you also have the polarity that you, that you connect the circuit to, and they can be opposite one another. Now, it just so happens that I have the schematic of a uh, sweep generator that I was working on earlier, and it's vacuum tube. What does vacuum tubes have to do with the transistor, you might ask? Well, I'm gonna answer this question. If you look at this vacuum tube, these, straight lines. Most of you who work with tubes uh, would recognize then that these are the anodes, correct? And this little larger line is the cathode. But strangely enough, we're connecting the positive to the cathode. How about that? But I thought the cathode is negative. <laughs> well, you have to understand when you start talking about uh, electron flow versus conventional flow of electricity, a lot of the terms can get confused. So this is the cathode. It has a negative charge. In other words, it is the source of electrons, of negatively charged electrons, but you want to connect your positive terminal to the negative element of this rectifier because everything goes plus to minus to plus to minus, right? When you connect two batteries in series, you don't connect the positives together and you don't connect the negatives together, do you? You connect the positive to the negative and then it's additive, right? You have the flow of current. If you put them back to back, they oppose one another and you'll have no, no flow of current. So, this is the same way. You connect the positive to the cathode. In other words, the positively charged element of your circuit goes to the negatively charged element of this diode. So I hope that makes a little more sense. So this is not incorrect. This is actually correct. And this is how it would be connected. And that's why the cathode element has the stripe. And you ever notice, you know, when you see that stripe on the diode, you can see here the, the little stripe there, that's going to be your cathode, even though you connect the positive to it. Hope that makes sense. But how about this? What if we were able to put another element in between this junction so that we could control the depletion regions. We can turn them on and off from an external source rather than just relying on the charge across the whole element to turn it on and off. Well, that's exactly what a transistor is. So if we look at this, if I take an N and P element which would be like a diode, and then I fuse another N element on the outside, I will essentially have a transistor. 
and you will have two sets of depletion regions here. And the way that you dope these, these depletion regions will be different from one another a little bit. And that difference that they have is the magic. That's what makes this thing work. Okay, let's use our water analogy. Let's say you have a pipe, and let's say that's the middle part of that pipe is flexible, so you can kind of squeeze it like rubber tubing. And let's say we put a pusher, a stopper right here, that will squeeze that tube shut. And in addition to that, we use a lever to push on it. So I just got to push a little bit on here to create a lot of force here to turn this off and back on. Well, that's kind of the principle of what a transistor is doing. So let's say we have the collector that collects the, the water or the electrons. And you have the emitter that emits the electrons. Okay, and we're talking about an NPN transistor here. And we have this base here. And this lever is your base voltage. So I'm not putting a whole lot of force because of the, all of the leverage here on this lever. It wouldn't take a lot of force to pinch this off, right? And the further... The, the stronger I make this lever, the less energy it's going to take, force it's going to take for me to pinch this off. Well, where we put that on the lever, where the fulcrum is, we'll call that our gain. Right? Gain is all about using a little bit of force to control a whole lot of force flowing through that pipe. And that's really the whole idea of a collector, base, and emitter of a transistor. Okay, now I'm not going to talk about the PNP transistors too much in this because it's essentially going to be the same theory, only the polarity is going to be backwards. And we'll look at this diode model here in a minute. That's the next thing we'll look at. But if you notice, you have a positive voltage on the emitter and a negative voltage on the collector, whereas on an NPN, you have negative voltage on the emitter and positive voltage on the collector. See how they're backwards? And that's essentially, the polarity is reversed. It's like taking the battery and turning it around the other way. And there is advantages to doing that in a circuit, but we're not gonna get a whole lot into that right now. So we're gonna focus on this video on the NPN transistor. And just know that if you apply the same theory to it, just reversing the polarities of the voltages, it's going to work the same. Okay, so here's a model of a transistor. Although this would never work like a transistor, and I'll, I'll repeat that here in a second, why? But essentially, when we look at an NPN transistor, it kind of acts, see, NPN, it kind of acts like two back-to-back -back diodes like that. See that? With the base being the junction between the two, and your emitter being one side and your collector being the other side. And I've shown this in multiple, multiple videos I've done, but just to make sure we have it in this one, we'll do it real quick. Okay, if we take our handy little multimeter and we measure, remember, we want the plus because it's N. PN, so the red is the plus, the black is the negative. And yes, some uh, volt ohm meters, the analog meters, the, the leads are swapped around, so the plus voltage is on the black lead. It's just the way they're designed. Uh, okay, so if we measure here, you'll see your voltage drop. And we saw that in our last video. And if we check from here to here, same thing. If I check from the emitter to the collector, no matter which way I go, I read nothing. And that's how it's supposed to work. Now, this transistor right here is an NPN transistor. And it, the leads go emitter, collector, 
base. So if I take my red lead and put on the base, and I go from base to collector, I see a voltage drop like a diode. Base to emitter, voltage like a diode. But take a look at the difference. If you go to this one, 551, 555, they're almost identical. Look at this one. The collector is 671 millivolts. The emitter, 675. All right. 671, 675. So it kind of acts like this because um, I told you that the diodes are not all the same all the time. There is little tiny inconsistencies. But if I took a thousand of these transistors and I measured from the base to the collector and the base to the emitter, see that? The base to the emitter junction will always be slightly higher voltage drop than the base to collector. Why is that? Why, why is the voltage drop? I mean, here I have, here's a whole, let's see, here's a whole strip of them, okay? And if I go down the road, all right, there's that one, there's the emitter. See that? Collector, emitter. Emitter's higher. Collector, emitter. Emitter's higher. Collector, emitter. Emitter's higher. See that? Every single time. Never fails. Okay, let's first do a couple of experiments with one of these transistors, and then we'll actually look at the actual data sheet for that transistor and see if we can figure out what some of these things mean. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to use one of these little multi-testers. And I'm going to put this transistor in here. And I'm going to write these down. The HFE, and I'll, we'll explain what these are here in a minute. 347, 3.16MA, 615, and 0.04 microamps. Or you're not been writing it down before it shuts off. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this transistor and I'm going to plug it into this little test circuit that I built. And this is by no means <laughs> an amplifier circuit. This is a test jig that we're going to just see if we can get this thing to uh, show us some information of how this transistor works. Okay, drawing this out to make a little more sense, I redrew it. So we have our voltage source 1, which is 10 volts, and vo voltage source 2, which is 10 volts. And I have a 1K current limiting resistor. And that's just going to prevent that if we turn this pot all the way up, it's not going to connect it straight to the voltage source because this is such a low voltage drop the current through here would be just insane. It would burn the transistor up. And then there's a one mega ohm pot, which is tells you how tiny we want the current to be here. In line from the wiper to the base of the transistor, I have a microamp meter. And that's this meter right here, and it's measuring the base current in microamps. I also have a meter going from here to here measuring millivolts, and that's going to be VBE. So VBE, which is better known as voltage between the base and the emitter. And that's this red meter, VBE. And then I have one more meter up here at the collector, and it's going to me measure collector current, or IC, which is also in milliamps. Now I could put another meter down here, an amp meter, and it would measure if it would actually read this plus this. 
So if there was you know, a couple microamps here and one milliamp here, let's just say, there would be one milliamp and a couple microamps on this meter. So you don't really need to do that, but that's it. All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna test some of these parameters and see what we come up with. Now with the wiper of the pot turned all the way to ground, we have no voltage between the base and emitter and there's no current flowing at the base or at the collector. As I start to turn this up, all of a sudden you have this quick change of voltage up here. And you can see as I rotate it, nothing's really happening here. I mean this is just noise you're looking at on the meter. This is just the meter will just read some erroneous noise in the background, but I mean, you know, 0.1 microamp and, you know, three microamps there. And it's reading negative even. If we keep going up, and you see how this is negative, you can actually get reverse leakage from the base to the collector, but we're not going to talk about that right now. This is going to turn positive though here. Once this hits conductance, which is going to be somewhere around that 500 millivolts or so, these are going to start moving. And watch, watch carefully. Just about there. Now it just started to turn on. See that? That jumped from a 1 to a 0.1 to a 0.2 microamps. And now we're at 0.03, so we're at 30 microamps out. Now watch if we go a little bit further. And you see there now it's starting to jump. And this one said it was starting to conduct somewhere around 615 millivolts. And we're at 611. Now as I start turning this up, all of a sudden, I'm rotating this pot. This is getting higher. This is getting higher. We're already up to almost three milliamps of current. This is hardly moving at all now. Watch me keep going. And if I go up to 14, 15 microamps, this is almost not changing at all. It's very, very slowly. This is going up, but look what's happening, what happening at the collector current. And the more I increase the base current, the more I increase the collector current. So let's try something here. Let's get this up to a nice round number. Let's go to about 5 milliamps of collector current. So. There's about five milliamps, give or take. So five milliamps with 14 microamps in, let's do the math. Five milliamps out divided by 0 0.014, which is 14 microamps. You have a gain of 357. And what did our meter say? 347. Wow! <laughs> Pretty amazing, huh? Okay, let's keep going now. If we keep turning this up, you can see that as I go up higher, this isn't really going up too much more. See that? Not much at all. So at some point in time, it quits amplifying. We call that saturation. And what happens is no matter what I do, I can go from 150 microamps of base current to 270. That doesn't change at all. And that's because the transistor is turned on. It's on as high as it can go. So there's nothing more it can do. And 
it doesn't matter what kind of base current now. Now here's the thing, we can change that because what's happening is the transistor actually wants to amplify more, but it can't because of the value of this transistor or of this resistor here. This is all going to make sense in a minute when we look at the charts. Let's turn this off now. And let's take this resistor here. That's a 1.2K or 1200 ohm. And let's just replace it with a 220 ohm resistor and just see what it does. Okay, if I could do this without shorting everything out, wouldn't that be fun? Okay, there. Now let's turn this up and see what happens. Once again, get up to our turn on voltage, our VBE, and then this is going to start going up and look what's happening now. Look at the gain now. I have, let's put 10 microamps in it, into the base. So there's 10 microamps at the base. We have 3.6 milliamps. So 3.636 divided by 0 0.01, 363. So you can see the gain has gone up a little bit, not much. Now watch what happens as we rotate this pot more and more. Remember the most we could get out of this was what? Seven or eight milliamps, something like that. Let's keep going. Now what's happening? 16, 17, 18, 9, 20, 24, 25, 27. So now we're starting to draw some current through that transistor. This transistor has a maximum current of 50 milliamps. So you don't want to exceed that or you'll overload the transistor. But this is a first lesson to learn. The values you choose for these resistors have to match the parameters of the transistor. Now, this was good, but this prevented the transistor from running at its maximum efficiency. In other words, it would hit the cutoff region much sooner, you know, it would fully turn on uh, before anything else would happen, right? Before we could get our full current out of it. If you do a little bit of math and you take 10 volts and you divide it by the 50 milliamps, you'll find that's going to be about 200 ohms. And I have a 220 ohm resistor in there right now, which is the correct value to get this base emitter junction to go almost to its limit. So you see how they work together? So as we change this resistor, because really this is a voltage divider here, isn't it? If I turn this all the way down to here, this is the base is grounded, that's where we are right now, but as I rotate this pot up, you have a voltage divider between here and down here, you know, above the wiper and below the wiper, and that voltage divider is going to pick off the voltage going through here, and you're going to have a voltage, your VBE, and when the voltage from here to here exceeds that VBE that you need, the 600 and some millivolts, then the transistor will start to conduct current. And that current will divide because you have this part of the resistor in parallel with this circuit right here, with the VBE, or with your base emitter junction, and it divides the current there. So this kind of provides a little, again, a little bit of stability. As we turn this up, then we're putting more voltage potential across here, but since this always clamps this circuit down to somewhere near the VBE, that's 600 and some millivolts, it'll creep up a little bit. The only thing can happen because of Ohm's law is the current has to go up. 
And that's exactly what happens. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So again, the current going into here and then the current limiting or the load that you're putting on here, this, this becomes your load, right? Then that's what's going to control how much amplification you can get and what the gain is. So the gain stayed the same, if you remember, you know, with this to here. But at some point in time, when you max out this circuit, putting more current here will make the gain actually go down. Because if I put this back in, put this other, this 1.2K, like that. If I turn this up, I mean, when we read it down in this range, you're still going to get that 300 and some gain. But once I get the cutoff, to where it's just the transistor's totally saturated and can't turn on anymore. So let's say we put 100 microamps, 8.37 milliamps divided by 0.104, your gain is now 80. Now, it makes you think that the gain is 80, but it really isn't. It's that the transistor is being current limited by this resistor up here. And just by simply taking this out and putting the correct resistor in, look at that. Now it's 28 milliamps. And if we do the math again, 28 divided by 0 0.104, 269. See how the gain changes? Or theoretically how it does? But this is, these are the different modes of operation of a transistor. I want you to get your mind wrapped around that first before we look at these charts. Because this is, these are the, the parameters that we work with when we're designing a transistorized circuit, you know, whether it's going to be for amplification or for a switch or whatever. All right, let's see if we can make some sense of what these data sheets mean. Again, we're going to use the KSC 1845. And looking at these first parameters on the front page. And you'll see your collector base voltage, collector emitter voltage. So this is called VCBO for collector base and VCEO, which is your collector emitter voltage. That's your maximum operating voltage. Now this can be a little bit confusing because if you go to the next page, there's another set of parameters as I bump the camera. And there's BVCBO and BVCEO. We'll get to this one last. And they pretty much have the same number, don't they? The same voltage rating. But they also have an associated current with them. So we're going to try to make sense of what, the, what this means and why it's important. And if you notice, they're all rated at 120 volts for this particular transistor. So what we're going to do is we're going to torture some components here and they're probably going to fail during this test. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. But we're going to try to make sense of what these symbols mean. And essentially what this is telling us is what the maximum open terminal voltage can be uh, for instance, on a transistor, when the transistor's turned off and I have a voltage potential of 120 volts between the collector and emitter, that is the maximum amount of voltage potential you can have between those terminals uh, before it will begin to fail. 
and as you start to turn this turn the transistor on that voltage will drop as the current and the current will start to increase between the collector base and collector emitter now when they put the letter b in front of there that means breakdown voltage that is how much reverse voltage so if you connect the terminals backwards the polarity backwards on the device how much can it handle in reverse before it will break down and the reason that they add this current rating on there is because once the once the uh, dot the transistor breaks down in other words it stops being a, an insulator it stops blocking the flow of electrons and starts being a conductor at a certain amount of current this will start to this number will start to drop and what what I mean by that is whatever power supply is connected in reverse bias if it can permit more than a hundred microamps for instance between the collector and base as you go up in reverse current this maximum voltage will drop I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of that so first things first we're going to go back to our regular uh, diode that we were testing in the previous video and let me see if I can add another one here let's start out with one of these 1N4007s because it's a thousand volt diode and this test device can only put out 323 volts maximum I don't know if you can see it better this way or this way probably with this little piece of film over it so we have 323 volts open circuit and it's current limited and you have a low current mode and a high current mode in low current mode if you go short circuit it's going to limit it to about 7 milliamps maximum and it's going to shows you that the voltage drop is very very low because I have a dead short and if I go onto this diode if I go forward bias you can see there's about a 0.7 volt drop at 6.5 milliamps and if I go to the high current you can see it's almost a 0.8 volt drop at 42 milliamps and we demonstrated this in the last video that as you put more current through the diode that forward voltage drop will increase and the same thing holds true with a transistor now since this diode has a 1000 volt breakdown voltage it means if I put the leads on backwards it will conduct no current at all because there's not enough reverse voltage to break the diode down now if, I, if this thing could put out more than a thousand volts you would see current starting to flow in the reverse direction and depending on how our current limit is set uh, that voltage will change so let's take a look at this diode now this is just a smaller rectifying diode and it's only rated at 80 volts peak reverse voltage and as a regular in forward bias it just acts like a diode once again and there's your 6.5 milliamps and it's about seven 750 millivolts forward voltage drop at that current but if I reverse it you'll see this 323 volts is way higher than 80 volts and currents gonna start to flow and you can see this diode is breaking down at about 90 volts and there's three milliamps of current flowing in reverse and you can see as the diode was heating up that voltage was changing did you see that it was going down if I allow higher current this can have up to 40 milliamps now this is probably going to trash this diode I don't know but if we put it in reverse you're going to see a lot more currents going to flow and this 90 volts is going to be lower than that it's actually going to be lower than the 80 volts that it's rated at watch this and you can see 30 volts 
29 volts. It was going to go down and down and down. So that's what they're talking about with these test parameters. Now the same thing holds true with this transistor. Let's go back to low current. And what it's saying is this has a maximum breakdown voltage of 120 volts. So we have our test device once again. And just remember the polarity here. We have the emitter, the collector, and the base. Now in forward bias, that would mean that the, for an NPN transistor, the positive lead would go on the collector, the negative lead would go on the emitter. Now of course if we were testing a PNP transistor, it would be the opposite, okay, because the current flows in an opposite direction in a PNP transistor. So if I put the negative lead on the emitter and the positive lead on the collector, that's forward bias. Remember, we have no connection on the base. So if the base doesn't have any current, there should be zero current flowing between emitter and collector, and this should stay at 323 volts, shouldn't it? So let's see what happens. And if we touch that, look what happens. It changes from 323 volts to 189 volts. See that? What that's telling me is that there is current flowing. Now the current is so tiny that this milliamp meter here can't read it because it's less than 0.1 milliamp. It's, it's in the microamps. But it is already beginning to break down. See that? 189, 190. See, it's going up a little bit. If I left it on there long enough, it would probably creep up a little bit more, maybe. I don't know. But you can see current begins to flow because we're above 120 volts. Now, of course, if I put less than 120 volts there, no problem. There would be no current flow. There'd be just the minuscule amount of leakage. But if I reverse the leads now, now I'm putting it the current, um, reverse biasing it. If I go from the emitter to the collector, and now the collector I'm putting the minus, the emitter I'm putting the positive, look what's happening. <laughs> this thing's really breaking down in reverse bias. You have 6.5 milliamps, and there's only an 8.6 volt drop across there with the thing in reverse bias like that. And if I go to large current, that voltage is going to get even worse. Look at that. Now we're drawing 42 milliamps. Okay, and the voltage actually stayed pretty similar around 8 volts. Yep, pretty close. But you can see this thing cannot be reverse biased above that 120 volts. Now, if, again, if this was less than that, if it was less than 120 volts, there would be no problem. Once. And just because some of you will ask, let's put it back into emitter. Let's put it back into forward bias, and I set it to high current mode. And you can see now it's really breaking down. Look at that. And see it's just changing and changing and changing. See how it keeps going down? And yep. Ooh, I just burned it. <laughs> it's fried. Because there was no current limit this time. And this is what I'm talking about. Do you see the little puff of smoke come off of there? I mean, I, get, I can't keep my hand on it. It's destroyed. We just destroyed it. And I did that on purpose. So that's what they're talking about here when you have this in the, the amount of current flowing does make a difference in how this is going to fail and as there's higher current the voltage gets lower this voltage drop gets lower and lower this breakdown voltage gets lower and lower and I think let's turn this off so I don't shock myself and I'm thinking we just took out that transistor. Let's see if we did. Okay. Yep. See that? 
So we now have an open between emitter and collector. Because we overloaded it, we put too much voltage and we allowed a 40 milliamp uh, current limit. So that current was so high, there was nothing to limit that from just going into what's called thermal runaway. And that's what just happened. And this is what happens as the transistor gets hotter, the voltage drop changes and it causes more of a short. It causes it to get hotter yet and it just gets worse and worse and worse and then eventually it destroys the transistor. So this one's done. So I'll fold those leads. But I wanted you to see how that works. Now remember throughout this whole test we never had anything connected to the base. So just by exceeding the voltage potential across emitter and collector, no matter which direction we had it, the transistor would conduct even though there was no base current. And the same thing happens when you apply voltage to the base like that, between base and collector or base and emitter. Same thing, although the voltage ratings are different. So for instance, on this, when you have the emitter to the base, you can only have a five volt potential on there. So if the reverse voltage is more than five volts from the emitter to the base, your transistor is going to start to conduct in reverse from the base to the, from the emitter to the base. Now the strange thing is because you have two separate junctions, if we connect our meter here, it is quite possible that if we go from the emitter to the base, so here's the emitter base, in one direction we read nothing and in the other direction it, it's a voltage drop. Do you see that? So the emitter base junction is still good and that's because they're two separate junctions. So there was no current flow between the emitter and the base when we tortured this thing <laughs> between emitter and collector and therefore that junction was okay. So when you see those rectangle pictures of the transistor you know with the doping on this side and this side and you have the N and then the P and then the N it's really not structured exactly like that, uh, how they're put together, let's say. So the point that I'm making is this is this is very important not to exceed the maximum voltage but also whatever kind of current limiting you have on the circuit is going to determine uh, how close you can get to this voltage. So what I'm saying is if you have, if you remember when we built that little test circuit earlier in the video and I had at first on the collector I had a 1.2k resistor and then I dropped it down to a 220 ohm resistor and that massively changed the amount of current, maximum current that could flow from the emitter to, from the collector to the emitter. Well, same thing here. If that resistor limits the current you know, to 100 microamps or whatever, we're good with this voltage. But as soon as you start, you have a circuit that is capable of delivering a lot more current than that, the transistor can actually fail uh, even a little bit below 120 volts, if that makes sense. It, it will take that voltage to get it to start conducting, but then once it sees that amount of current in there, this it'll drop <laughs> and if you start to reduce the volt or reduce the voltage below 120 you still may not stop it from conducting until you get way below 120 volts remember transistors don't they they're a moving target and that's what I'm trying to show you on here and that's very important when you're looking at the different parameters and I know some of this is confusing because there's a lot to know in a short amount of video time, but 
when you're looking at something like this, you may not be thinking about the whole picture. Let's see if I can find a schematic real quick. So here's just like a theoretical section out of the SA9800 Pioneer amplifier. I just want to show you something here. You have your NPN transistor and your PNP transistor. This is called a complementary pair. And if you look, there's a positive voltage and a negative voltage. And then ground is at the center point. So if these two voltages are equal, okay, then the center point will be zero volts. So the whole idea is you, when you first turn these on, that's the purpose of this little circuit here, is to just barely turn these on past that 0.7 volt drop that we looked at. And they will both turn on an equal amount and then this center point will stay at zero volts. But what happens is, theoretically, from here, if this thing were to dead short and there was no load on the output, let's say this, this speaker was not connected, essentially you would have the negative voltage on the emitter and the positive voltage on the collector. So the voltage between these two points would be this plus this. So you would have, let's say you have plus and minus 50 volts, there would be 100 volts potential between these two points here, from the negative 50 to the positive 50, from here to here. So what I'm trying to say is just because this is a 50 volt source up here, that doesn't necessarily mean you would put a transistor that has a maximum reverse breakdown voltage of 50 volts, right? You would want it to be the total between these two. So it would have to be in excess of 100 volts for it to not go into reverse bias and do what we just did with our little test device. Does that make sense? So when we're looking at a voltage rating for a replacement transistor for this, we would want this number, okay, your maximum breakdown voltage, we would want it to be the total that could theoretically happen. If this transistor accidentally turns on the whole way, it's going to pass most of this voltage through here and to this point. And then you're going to have this voltage up here at this point, so the potential between these two points is going to be this plus this, like I said, which plus and minus 50 would be 100 volts. So you this is a 120 volt device, so theoretically it would work in here. Now I'm not talking about maximum wattage, this is the output that drives the speakers and this is a little tiny signal transistor, but we're just talking about voltage itself. Then we also have to talk about current, and when we want to talk about current, we have to look at, if this is a 50 volt supply, if this turns on full full way, which it's not going to, but let's just theoretically say it will. If this is on the whole way, you're going to have 50 volts. This is turned off right now because it's push-pull. And you're going to have 50 volts right here, let's just say. Let's pretend. 50 volts across this speaker, which is only going to be 8 ohms, right? Speakers are low impedance. So we're going to say this is 8 ohms. And actually, at DC, it's less than 8 ohms. It's going to be closer to 4 ohms or 6 ohms, right? But let's just pretend it's 8 ohms. If I put 50 volts, 50 volts divided by 8 ohms is 6 and a quarter amps of current times 50 volts is 312 watts. Now you're going to say, well, Tony, a 50 volt rail doesn't, this doesn't ever make a 300 watt amp. Well, it doesn't because these never turn on that way the whole way. But what I'm saying is theoretically, if this thing goes, you know, goes crazy and turns all the way on, that is the maximum potential that could go from here to here. That's a lot of wattage, 300 watts, which is why you'll see, you know, a 100 watt amp will not have a 100 watt transistor in there. It'll have two or three 100 watt transistors or more all in parallel to split the load. 
on each side. And that's why you see ganged transistors on really high power amplifiers. Like you get into, when we did that Pioneer SX 1980, I think it had, you know, four transistors on each side or six on each side, something like that, some ridiculous amount. And that's why. Now the emitter base voltage is the same thing. It's, it's much more, much lower though. Notice it's only five volts. So you might say to yourself, well, why, why are we talking about emitter to base voltage? I thought VBE is always the forward voltage drop. Well, remember, we're talking about putting the voltage in reverse. So let's see. I have this little diode tester. It's a Zener diode tester. And if I go from emitter to base in one direction, you can see it has a regular voltage drop. And that's your VBE. But if I put it in reverse, it breaks down at about 8.5 volts with, at 2 milliamps. And I can actually control the current on this. If I go to 5, it goes to 8.57. 10 milliamps, 8.61. 15, 8, 6, 3, and back to 2 milliamps. And that's what they're talking about. So, of course, we were testing at 5 milliamps and 2 milliamps and so forth, but they're rating it, they're doing their measurement at 100 microamps or 0.1 milliamp. So it says that you, you, will have, you can have a maximum of 5 volts with 100 microamps of reverse current. Now forward is different, and you saw that. So that's what they're telling you about. So you have to kind of watch some of these voltages here. This is the open terminal voltage maximum you can have before the transistor will start to conduct on its own. And this is the reverse voltage that it can handle before it starts to conduct and breaks down. And it shows you, uh, if you limit that current to 100 microamps, for instance, from collector base and one milliamp from collector emitter, you can have a maximum of 120 volts. But again, if more current is flowing in reverse, then this number will start to drop. So. What does that mean? I mean, current can't flow if you're not at the <laughs> breakdown voltage. So, well, once that voltage breaks down, what's going to happen is if the current is higher than one milliamp, that voltage is going to, to be lower and lower. In other words, you're not going to be able to, just by turning the voltage up, current is already flowing. Now you can't turn it off and that voltage is going to be lower. So like, for instance, we saw 80 volts. So at 80 volts, it's still conducting and it's conducting a lot of current. So the thing, the point that I'm making with semiconductors in general is the amount of current flowing affects these voltages dramatically, both forward and reverse. Now, cutoff current, let's look at that. Let me turn off this tester before I shock myself with it. Because <laughs> I'm going to use one of the probes as a pointer. So, the cutoff current is the, the minimum current at which the transistor can conduct. In other words, if you have lower than 50 nanoamps of current in a circuit that you're trying to turn on and off, in other words, if it's current limited, you remember we changed that resistor on the, on the uh, collector resistor and how it limited the current. If that collector resistor were so high that you couldn't get more than 50 nanoamps to flow at full voltage, then this transistor will never turn on no matter what you do with the base. Okay. Same thing with the emitter base. 
or the VBE, I should say, you have to have a minimum of 50 nanoamps of current in order for the transistor to operate. So if the circuit is limited below 50 nanoamps of current, this transistor will be no good for this circuit. You probably want to go to you know, uh, an FET or something like that. And we'll get into that stuff maybe another time. I think this is the most interesting one, is your gain. Now, we did some calculations earlier in the video about gain, and the gain is your, you know, base current in versus what kind of collector current you get out. And they have two different parameters of it, HFE1 and HFE2. The first one is at low current, so 0.1 milliamps. And they're showing you the range of gain that you can have with these transistors. When they make these transistors, they're mass produced. And they're sorted into gain ranges, which is this down here. But even when you buy one, like with, a, with the letter P at the end of it, or F, or E, or U, it still has a range of gains. So for instance, if you have a, a U-rated KSC1845, all they're guaranteeing is that the gain of that transistor under this parameter here, this parameter, HFE2, will be somewhere between 600 and 1200. <laughs> so that's a pretty big range, you know? Same thing here, 200 to 400, you know, for the low gain version. But they are sorted. But in reality, a KSC1845, if you don't look at the any of the other signifiers after it, those transistors can have anywhere from a gain of 200 up to a gain of 1200. That's a big range. And they just sort it by four different ranges that they they sort them by. And typically, this is a decent range for whatever circuit you're designing, so that's not a problem. So when we talk about gain-matching transistors, do I have to buy an expensive curve tracer and uh, match all my transistors? Well, you probably don't in this day and age. If you buy a transistor and they're all P-rated transistors, you know that the gain is going to be within this range on every one of them. So, for instance, I have these ones here. They're all on the same strip. They all, these are KSC1845 FC, okay, FCH, I think that's what that says. And I believe the F means that it's a 300 to 600 range. And if you notice, the ones that we've all been testing have been around 370, 380, somewhere like that, between 3 and 400. They're all very close. And they're all going to be within that three to six hundred range, and that's the whole the whole point of buying the ones with the signifiers. So they're going to be matched somewhat. Uh, the VBE might be a little bit different on them, but again, they're all going to be pretty close too. So if you don't have a means of matching gain matching transistors under a certain current, and remember. These little cheap eBay testers, they do measure gain, but they only measure at a very low current and one single current. So it may not be mimicking the same thing that's, that's going to be in the circuit that you're using. So if you're replacing a transistor in an amplifier and you test the gain on it here, when you plug that transistor into the amplifier, it's not going to have the same gain as this unless it's using the same current ratings that this is using to test it. Hope that makes sense. So really, you're not going to be able to match transistors unless you have the right equipment. But because they do such a good job of sorting them and then signifying them, if you buy all F-grade 2SC 1845s, you're pretty much going to have a match set of transistors. In other words, if I just pull two of these off the strip, any two random ones, they're probably going to be close enough matched that you're not going to have to worry about it. So there's kind of a lesson on transistor matching. Now, some transistors out there don't have that benefit. They just give you the range 200 to 1200, and, well, you will have to test those ones. But the ones that are sorted like this, you can do that. 
So that's another reason I like these KSC 1845s and KSA 992s. I can buy them in certain gain ranges. Now you see VBE on. Well, what they're showing you here is, again, the voltage between the base and emitter. And that's that 600 millivolts we were talking about, right? Well, here they're saying that it, it normally operates anywhere from 550 to 650 millivolts. And you saw that. We were on the up, this transistor in particular was kind of in the upper range of that. It was a little up around 600 millivolts or so. And it can be anywhere in this range and it would be considered a good transistor. Now remember that that base current is a total function of that voltage. So that's why when we match transistors, there's two things that you want to match. One is the VBE. So when you put the same test voltage between the base and emitter, or same current, I should say, these should they should match one another. So I take two transistors like this, you know, and I put the voltage, I put the current between from the base to the emitter. Technically, they should both have the same voltage at which they turn on and start conducting. That's what you call VBE matched transistors. Conversely, if we do this test up here and we measure and we do the math, remember I showed you with the calculator how we did the current out versus the current in, and we do the math and they both read the same, then these transistors are said to be gain matched. Now, in some circuits, it's more important that they be gained gain matched, especially like in a like in a voltage amplifier circuit or something. Whereas when you're working with things that are uh, that you have the the base emitter junctions are kind of tied to the same place, then you want the VBE to be matched. So, for instance, on uh, some of those the input amplifier, like the differential pair, you you want to have a matched VBE on those because that base current can have a big, big effect on things. So again, that gets a lot more into different circuit types. Gain current bandwidth product. Now this is a really important one. Remember we were talking about on the diode we had, where was it? They were showing this, four volts, one megahertz, and the, the capacitance and so forth. Well, that really comes into play when you're dealing with transistors, because transistors are all about switching signals on and off, and not every signal that you switch on and off uh, it is going to be going from one DC level to another DC level, you know, from on to off. Sometimes you're varying that signal over time, as if, like, in an audio amplifier with sound. And what you're going to find out, this lowercase f, uppercase t, that is your transition frequency. So what happens with a transistor is... As you increase the frequency of at the base, so in other words, you're no longer putting a DC level on the base, you're putting a varying signal on the base, like a sine wave, for instance. If we set up these parameters, again, six volts at one milliamp of collector current, what you're gonna find out is these transistors, somewhere between 50 and 110 megahertz, there will no longer be any gain in that transistor. In other words, this here will drop from, I don't know, 600 to zero, to, to a gain of one was what I should say, unity gain. So what they're saying is if a transistor has a transition frequency of 50 megahertz, at 50 megahertz, the HFE becomes one. That's what transition frequency is. And it's a sliding scale. As you go below 50 megahertz, 40, 30, 20, 10, one megahertz, and so forth, the gain keeps going up, 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 
until you hit your DC current gain level. And see, that's why I said at the beginning of the video, the HFE versus beta versus all that. AC gain is a sliding scale. There is no one number because you have to know what frequency you're operating it at to be able to figure that out. And even that, you won't see much, the charts aren't real accurate with that. They can just tell you the maximum frequency at which you hit unity gain. And if you go above this, let's say you go up to 200 megahertz, it will actually have negative gain and really high distortion, but the gain, you will actually have to put more signal into the base than you're gonna get out of the collector emitter. And that's because of the transition frequency, once you get through that transition frequency. And it has to do with what we talked about in the diode video again, the slew rate. That junction needs a certain amount of time to charge up and to, and to become active. In addition to that, you have a capacitance in there called that we refer to as Miller capacitance. And again, those two things affect the maximum frequency of the transistor. So that's why this is a very important thing. Uh, and so for instance, you'd look at this transistor and you'd say, well, the worst case scenario, the worst one in the batch would be 50 megahertz. And my stereo, I'm only listening up to what, 25 kilohertz maybe? Just kilohertz? So this is way beyond that. But you have to understand when you're using global negative feedback and you have a feedback loop and so forth, the reaction time of that really adds to the, to the slew rate and everything. And then these sorts of things become a little more critical. Um, but as a rule of thumb, you know, <laughs> this is way overkill for, for what we're going to be using it for. Um, so that's pretty much what that means. What I generally try to do is whatever the transition frequency of the original transistor is, I try to be within that same range. And you can see it can be double just with this. So if, if I was using this, designing a circuit with this transistor, I would never use this transistor in a circuit that is above the minimum, which is 50 megahertz. And even with that, I would be way below that because at this, it's not a transistor anymore. It's just a switch because there's no gain. So it really doesn't matter whether it's 50 to 100. I, this, this is something I would only use maybe in a 5 megahertz circuit or something like that. And conversely, when you have a transistor that has a transition frequency of 1 megahertz, like the old 2N3055s, the original Motorola's from the 60s, that's a really... <laughs> very low frequency transistor and it will affect your sound especially when you have negative feedback and things going on you'll notice it now these last couple of things output capacitance so again just like the diode had junction capacitance and they had a voltage and a frequency this one when you have collector base voltage of 30 volts and you have zero emitter voltage at a frequency of one megahertz, this will act like a 1.6 picofarad capacitor. That's very, very low, by the way. Um, a lot of these older transistors will have a much higher capacitance than that. And you have to figure that into there because that can affect the circuit. It's just like putting a one picofarad capacitor in the, into the circuit. So you have to remember that when you're designing. Noise level. And this just again shows you under these parameters how many millivolts of noise it'll produce. And what you're going to find out is if you go through all this, this is a very low noise transistor. It's designed to be a low noise. This is perfect for audio. Again, this is why the KSC 1845, KSC 945, 
and then the PNP version, which would be like the KSA992. These are all really good audio transistors because they're low noise, high gain, high transition frequency, and they have a, a high breakdown voltage. All desirable things in these classic audio amps that we work on on this channel. So that's why you see me use them so often. And they're very versatile, very versatile. All right, now, all these charts. Do you need all these charts and graphs? Well, it depends on if you're designing a circuit or if you are just replacing a transistor, you know, an existing one with another one. Uh, there, that's what determines whether you need to worry about this or not. But you see these funny looking curves. I think some of you have seen these online before when we have things like this, our transistor curve tracer. And I know a lot of you want me to do a video on this. Number one, I got to get a little better at driving this thing. Um, but the bigger thing is it needs a little bit of work. The looping compensation knob has come off and some of the contacts in here need to be cleaned. And these are very delicate to work on. So I have to go over it. It is in perfect condition, just needs some maintenance done. And I just haven't had the time to dig into it and do that. But this is a device that actually will let you see these curves just like this. That's what it looks like. And what this is showing you is collector current versus collector emitter voltage versus base current. And of course, you can use your base current at your collector current at a certain voltage, and you can do the math, and you can determine what the gain is going to be at any particular bias setting. And the way they do that on a curve tracer is they have it's a signal generator that creates a stepped current source. In other words, it's a constant current source that moves in st like a staircase. And each one of those currents, it'll draw out that, you know, from zero volts up to the maximum voltage that's selected by the curve tracer. And it'll show you how it works, you know, how the transistor conducts. And you can see down here, before you get past your VBE, there's really not a whole lot of current. But once you get around that, you know, half a volt, all of a sudden, boom, it goes up and it's pretty, pretty stable. And you can see the current will stay pretty consistent versus this current here. Now, if you notice at higher voltages, there's ever so slightly higher gain, you know, with the same two microamps at the base, there's a wee little bit more gain at five volts than there is at one volt. We call that the early effect. And again, these are all little terms that you're going to hear over and over again, and you're going to have to learn as you work with this stuff. But that's what these little curves are that you're looking at. It's showing as we put higher base current, see up here is 16 microamps of base current. This is two microamps of base current. And just as you would expect, at 16 microamps of base current at four volts, you're going to get about nine, maybe nine and a half milliamps of collector current. Only a couple more things to look at. VBE on. So your, this is your forward voltage drop from the base to emitter. Like we, we've talked about this a lot in this video. And when you apply a voltage from the collector to emitter of six volts, so you put a six volt supply and you limit that to one milliamp, your VBE should be somewhere between 550 and 650 millivolts. All right. And but if you change collector emitter voltage and you change collector current, this is going to change. As you go higher in this, this forward voltage drop will go higher. It will increase. And we observe that in our tests. VCE saturation voltage, so your collector to emitter saturation voltage. What that means is 
once the voltage drop between so as a collect as your transistor turns on more and more you put more current through the base and it allows more current to flow through the emitter and collector eventually at some point in time that voltage drop on the emitter collector will drop it'll get smaller and smaller and smaller when that voltage drop when the transistor is turned full on in other words it can't really amplify anymore you'll have about anywhere from 70 millivolts to 300 millivolts of drop be in the transistor between the emitter and collector with these parameters so with a hot and you can see one milliamp of base current remember we were driving the base in that transistor with microamps not milliamps of current so you you figure at one milliamp that transistor is full on as hard as it can turn on it can't change so putting more than one milliamp at that point is not going to really change turning the because the transistor's on already look there's only a 300 millivolt drop across the transistor you can't turn it on anymore you can't make any less <laughs> of a voltage drop than that and that's what they're saying so that's what your saturation voltage is gain bandwidth product or your transition frequency now we talked about that just like we have transition frequency or just like we had a frequency component of the diode where it can't turn on and off quickly enough you have the same thing in a transistor and what they're saying is at a certain frequency if you turn the transistor on and off this many times per second the transistor will no longer exhibit any forward current gain why because you're not giving the transistor enough time you're not giving the depletion region enough time to come up to its full charge so that it can turn on the transistor properly so it's only partially turning the depletion region on before it's turning it back off again and the in the because the when you when you apply base current to a transistor that depletion region takes a certain amount of time to charge up to catch up and then it will come up to its full charge and then the transistor will have its forward voltage or current gain but it takes time it's a teeny amount of time I mean 50 megahertz in this case you know so 50 millionth of a second <laughs> but nevertheless it takes that amount of time and it, if you shut it back off before it turns all the way back on you're not going to get a full collector current are you it's going to be less so the higher you go in frequency the lower the gain of the transistor so that's why and the point at which the transistor the input at the base is equal to the output at the collector so when your base current and collector current become the same that's your transition frequency because your gain becomes one it's one to one so I call that unity gain if I go above that frequency it gets worse you actually get less current from collector emitter than you do between base and emitter so that transition frequency is kind of the tipping point where it's no longer a transistor and actually starts becoming a resistor kind of sort of and what they're saying is that they're guaranteeing the minimum transition frequency of one of these transistors is going to be 50 megahertz but it can be as high as 100 megahertz it varies widely but basically the this is a relatively high frequency transistor although they have them going way up into the hundreds of megahertz so this transistor would not be something you would use in, a, in an FM tuner for instance because FM broadcast can be you know in the RF section can be up to 108 megahertz well the transistor isn't doing very much when you get up to that frequency on this one so you would need it one with a much higher transition frequency and even 
even half of this when you're running the frequency, the gain is going to be severely compromised. So the idea is you want a transistor that has way higher uh, transition frequency than the frequency you're going to be operating it at. Does that make sense? You don't want to use a 100 megahertz transistor in a 100 megahertz circuit. You might use a 100 megahertz transistor in a 10 megahertz circuit. That would be good. But again, the closer you get to this, the lower this gain up here is going to be. It's going to way affect this up there where we at the forward gain. So hopefully that makes sense. Now the first thing I should mention is that output capacitance and Miller effect are not the same thing, but they are related. The Miller effect is is something that happens in like an amplifier. Like so when you have a transistor uh, set up as an in a, for instance in a stereo amplifier or whatever it's an effect that happens from the in your interaction between the input and output capacitance of the transistor so for instance the cob is your output capacitance which is the capacitance between the base and collector and that's a real capacitance it has to do with the the junction of the transistor and it is a real capacitance. But Miller capacitance or Miller effect is not a capacitor, but rather an effect that acts like a capacitor. And it has to do with the input capacitance of the circuit versus this output capacitance. And whenever you have feedback in the circuit, it multiplies this output capacitance. So your, you know, tiny one or two picofarad uh, output capacitance can act like or seem like a really high capacitance compared to this. So the Miller effect refers to an increased effective input capacitance at the input terminal of the transistor due to the presence of output capacitance at the other terminal. And it's pretty much multiplied by the voltage gain of the amplifier due, due to the Miller effect. So it results in a higher effective capacitance that you see at the base of the transistor. And that will, of course, reduce the bandwidth of the amplifier, affecting your transition frequency also. <laughs> so, so essentially, at higher frequencies, the Miller effect get, makes, makes it even worse or, and worse if that makes sense. So when you're working with a really low frequency circuit, the Miller, Miller effect isn't as bad, but you just have to remember when you're dealing with something with high amounts of feedback or you're dealing with something with high frequency, the Miller effect will be a big deal because it'll take this output capacitance and make it seem like it's much higher than it is. So I hope that makes sense. But just so you understand, Miller capacitance and output capacitance are two different things that we're talking about. Now again, I could reverse all the wires so the polarities are back, positive and negative or backwards, and I could plug a KSA992, which is the PNP version of this transistor. And all of these numbers would do exactly the same thing. They would work the same way. It's just the way it is. and. Just so you know, if I take this other transistor, this NTE107, and I just leave everything else the same, and I just change out the transistor, I'm getting about the same VB or uh, base current, but look what's happened to my collector current. And if I turn the base current up, it does work, but you can see in order to get one milliamp, I need 123 microamps. So let's do the math on that. So one milliamp divided by 0.124, let's say, you only have a gain of about eight. <laughs> it really sucks. 
And if I plug this into here, and that's under those conditions. Twelve. So you can see this is a very low gain transistor. This may even this may even be a defective transistor, or it could be a really high frequency transistor because some of the really high frequency transistors have really low gain, uh, just kind of by design. Here is a let's see a KSC nine forty five instead of the eighteen forty five, and I think these have a little bit lower gain. And they do, see that? 124 microamps of base current, and I'm only getting 20 milliamps out. Whereas with this KSC 1845, it was already driven, I think, into saturation. No, 29 milliamps, so it's a little bit higher. So those are how transistors work. I hope that helps. Now these videos take a lot out of me, <laughs> especially since you know I'm not the best at this. I don't design circuits, any any kind of things like that. I don't work with these things other than the hobby thing, working on stereos anymore. I did a lot more of this years ago, but you know I just don't do it as much. When you start managing a company, you don't do this kind of the kind of work that you used to do so um, I'm gonna go back to <laughs> repairing stereos in the next video and I'm sure some of you right now are jumping for joy because you're bored to death by this kind of stuff but for those of you who wanted to see s some things of how a transistor works and to tie that into the transistor substitution video I did hopefully that helped you out um, I'm sure I got some things wrong and I'm sure I didn't do as good of a job explaining as other people and I'm sure I was longer winded than other people would be. So those of you who do this more than I do and can add into the comments in a few simple words some things that I didn't do a good job of explaining, go for it. That's how we all learn. I, I will appreciate it. So until next time and you see a stereo on this bench, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And I thank you all. I thank my patrons out there that I don't thank nearly enough. And uh, basically, I thank all of you. Uh, it, you're a good community out there, and it's why I do this. I know if people, did, I say this before, but if people didn't help me, I wouldn't have had a chance at all. So. If I reach one of you out there who's learning and you learn something from my videos and you turn it into a career, it's all worth it for me. So till next time, or you know, even if this just helps some of you who may be, you know, shut in or something and can't get out and you know, tinkering with this stuff, man, it's all worth it. So best wishes to all of you, and until next time, stay well. Bye-bye.